Hi, everyone, and welcome to the fourth event in our two-week-long two conference, Informal Criminalized Precarious Sex Workers Organizing Against Barriers. My name is Lorelai Lee, and I'm a sex worker activist, writer, and organizer. I'm a co-founder of the Disabled Sex Workers Coalition, a founding member of both the Upstate New York Sex Workers Coalition and Decrim Massachusetts, a researcher and analyst with Hacking Hustling, and a Justice Catalyst Fellow at the Cornell Gender Justice Clinic. The Sex Workers Organizing Against Barriers Conference is co-facilitated by the Disabled Sex Workers Coalition, Hacking Hustling, Cornell Law School Gender Justice Clinic, Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, and the Center for in Information Technology and Public Life at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I am so appreciative of our conference co-organizers, Rachel Kuo, Danielle Blunt, Zara Stardust, and Tiffany So, as well as of our conference co-sponsors, the Berger International Legal Studies Program, the Dorothy S. Clark Program in Feminist Jurisprudence, the Cornell Labor Law Clinic, the Cornell Student Chapters of Outlaw, National Lawyers Guild, Women's Law Coalition, and the Black Law Students Association. Justice Catalyst, the Red Umbrella Fund, and the Asian American Feminist Collective. Special thanks also to Livia Folds, Naomi Loren, Eves, and Alexis Briggs for all of your work and support. As I think you all can probably tell, this conference was born out of a lot of collective work and a lot of collective dreaming. Thank you also to all of you who have donated via our Eventbrite page. Our co-sponsors and our public donations ensure that we can follow one of our core ethics in this organizing, which is to pay people for their labor. In particular, sex worker organizers who do so much work that is unrecognized and unfunded. For each of our conference panels, closed captioning is available, and the recordings and transcripts will be available afterward on hackinghustling.org, where you can also find the full event schedule. A recording of today's panel will also be available afterward on the Berkman Klein Center's events page. Our community agreements are adapted from the Asian American Feminist Collective, Brave Space, Collective Sex, Alt Div Hummingbirds and Buy Us For Us and are as follows. First, to bring in our histories and to speak from our own experiences. Second, to be committed to each other's collective learning and growing. Third, to be open to learning. Fourth, to respect the diversity of our identities, which particularly for this conference includes not assuming the identities of organizers and activists for whom sharing every element of our lived experience is not always safe. Fifth, to practice not using ableist language. Sixth, to prioritize care for ourselves and each other. This last agreement in particular is a disability justice issue, and both our panelists and our audience members should feel free to do whatever is needed to care for yourselves during this conference, including standing up, moving around, lying down, or even disengaging from any of the events at any time. We are very grateful to have panelists zooming in from most continents on the earth, <laughs> uh, all of them except Antarctica. Uh, and many of our panelists are zooming in from North America or Australia, where we are living on stolen land that is always and still indigenous land. To learn more about the land you are living on, you can look at the resources collected by the Native Governance Center, which are available at nativegov.org. And now I'm very privileged to be able to introduce uh, our moderator and organizer of this panel, uh, Zara Stardust, is a former Hustler Honey, Australian Penthouse Pet, and Feminist Porn Awards Heartthrob of the Year. Her PhD research explored the regulation, ethics, and interventions of in independent queer and feminist pornographies. She is an activist, lawyer, and academic, and has written numerous book chapters journal articles and media on sexuality, criminal law, human rights, public health, and labor organizing. She is currently a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society and a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Automated Decision-Making and Society at the Queensland University of Technology. So now I'm going to hand it over to Zara. Hi, 
Hello and welcome to Decoding Stigma, Designing Sex Worker Liberatory Futures. And we're so glad to have you all here. Thank you so much, Lorelai, for your incredible work in hustling and bringing this whole conference together. Uh, I'm Zara Stardust. I am fellow here at Beckman Klein Center at Harvard, but I'm zooming in today from the unceded and stolen land of the Turbul and Yugara peoples of the Kurilpa Peninsula, also known by its colonial name of Brisbane, Australia. And I want to pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. I recognize that colonization is ongoing, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. As Laurel, I mentioned, this is the third of three lunchtime panels, um, and the first explored the role that sex workers played in building up the economic infrastructure of the internet. The second explored sex worker activism, experiences of exclusion from online space and barriers to organizing. And today we are going to be building on from those two events to have a panel discussion on what the internet might look like if it was designed by sex workers and how we might code sex worker ethics into future design. This collaboration began with the aim of bringing together conversations on sex and tech within the academy, and the series also follows on from Hacking Hustling's previous conference that was held at the Berkman Klein Centre and sponsored by the Cyber Law Clinic in 2019. And our starting point was that sex workers hold unique insights into the real world impacts of platform capitalism, pastoral politics, digital surveillance and sexual gentrification. But so often our time is occupied in reactive rather than generative space. We're crisis organizing, fighting against bad policy, poor design, criminal laws, and this saps up the energy that we could be using, dreaming and imagining different futures. So we wanted to discuss if we took a sex worker lens to tech ethics, how we, might we envision a radically different online space? What might we, we build for one another? What would alternative community standards look like? Different terms of use. How would our content be organized? What would co cooperative governance look, look like? How could we use consent frameworks to conceptualize data privacy? What does it mean for our spaces to be accessible? And what kinds of legal, political, social, cultural, economic and material changes would be necessary to even make all of this possible? A few things about how today's session will be run. We're going to hear from Gabriela Garcia, who's the founder of Decoding Stigma uh, and a postdoctoral fellow at NYU. We're also going to hear from Chibundo Iguatu, a PhD candidate at, um, in socio, sociocultural anthropology at Illinois. And we're going to hear from Yin Q, who's a founder and creative director at Kink Out, Body of Workers, and a co-organizer with Red Canary Song. So each are going to speak for 10 minutes and then we will have a 10 minute panel discussion where they've kindly agreed to ask each other spontaneous questions for your enjoyment. I don't know what they are, it's a surprise. Uh, and then we will open up into audience Q&A. So please go ahead and use the Q&A function to ask your questions along the way. And we encourage sex workers to the front. I also encourage you to live tweet today's session. We're using the hashtag sex workers organizing. It's the American spelling with a Z. So if you have capacity and you feel enthused, please tweet along at hashtag sex workers organizing. So to begin, first up, we have Gabriela Garcia. Uh, Gabriela is a postdoctoral fellow at NYU's interactive telecommunication program with a research focus on cybernetic intimacy and the promotion of sexual ethics in the tech design space. Her current work is Decoding Stigma, a collaborative effort to bridge the gap between sex work, technology, and academia. In addition to her own research, Gabriella is the acting managing editor of Adjacent, NYU's journal for emergent interactive media. Gabriella also sits on the community advisory board for Urban Justice Center's Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, STOP. Take it away, Gabriella. Thank you, Zara, and thank you to all the uh organizers, uh, sponsors, the collaborators at Decoding Stigma and attendees today. Uh, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Obviously I'm quite nervous, so apologies for any um, future snafus. 
Um, so yes, I am co-founder of Decoding Stigma. So I'm naming this talk after that, uh, or why it is time to have the talk with technologists. Um, this is how you can reach me. Uh, my Instagram, Twitter, uh, and Venmo is Stabriella. Uh, donations during this talk will be given to Swap Behind Bars. And Decoding Stigma is basically decoding stigma dot however you want to find it. So the background of decoding stigma really starts with this thought. Uh, to big tech, the sex worker is as indispensable as they are disposable. And this starts with the last two panels left off. So thank you um, for setting me up to bat here. Uh, and I'm about to provide a quick crash course for those who didn't attend them. Apologies for redundancies for those who have. In the spirit of Melissa Gera Grant, we must understand that all sexual commerce is technological. Erotic labor built the internet and pretty much financed all mass media communications before it, visible to the mainstream or not. These are images from traveling stereoscopic porn and peep shows from the 1800s. This type of erotic material fiscally supported the emergence and distribution of photography. Uh, this, the term call girl comes from the fact that high-end brothels were some of the first urban institutions to install telephones. Uh, money made from the erotic market of the proto-internet in the 80s and 90s literally paid for the material infrastructure uh, for mainstream commercial internet by pushing demand for better computer graphics, faster processing speeds, and greater data bandwidths. Uh, once established, digital sex workers were first to invest in encrypted payment processors, literally the first users of PayPal, uh, for access to adult content. Um, but we currently live in a present in which technology is explicitly built to target and eliminate sex work. It's, it's a turn toward what we call horphobic tech design. In development, the creative input and experience of sex workers is totally exploited. Essentially, horphobic design can be thought of as digital vice rates, attempting to sanitize the internet. Digital vice raids come in the form of deplatforming and restriction of access to resources such as income, education materials, community, and the ability to move freely through both digital and physical space. This is an image of um, a uh, Stanford deep dive project, uh, which was part of DARPA's um, Darknet search, and they basically brag about obtaining, scraping unconsensually over 30 million advertisements posted by sex workers on the internet um, in order to uh, basically uh, research and deploy unchecked surveillance technology. And this ultimately profiles and further harms at-risk communities. Digital sanitation is sold as making the internet safer, but as with any gentrification, the question is safer for whom and at the express expense of what pre-existing communities. So we go back to our original thought. To big tech, the sex worker is as indispensable as they are disposable. Um, it leads to the question of why. When you look at the history, it becomes clear that the answer is exploitation toward the goal of profit-driven growth. Is this really what we want technology to be? Another narrative of extraction where vulnerable parties who have cultivated creative survival strategies are utilized and then brutalized for the benefit of the fewest, most privileged individuals. At best, the narrative is boring, and at worst, it's violently tyrannical, which is the reality that we live in today. Um, I argue that the sex worker must play a crucial symbiotic role in the design space. What if instead of being violently censored, sex workers were celebrated and platformed for the enormous amount of creative capital they have generated for the output of consumer level technology? In, in including sex worker voices in the design space, uh, 
it becomes a locus for a radical feminist design justice movement that recognizes the complicated relationship between sex, society, and human computer interaction design. Or as Blunt from Hacking Hustling more succinctly says, if we create technology that is safe for sex workers, we likely create a technology that is safe for everyone. And I quote this in almost every talk I give, I can't quote it enough. So this is where decoding stigma begins. Um, at its core, decoding stigma is a cross-institutional cohort working to prioritize sexual autonomy as a necessary ethics question for futurists. We are an interdisciplinary cross-institutional mix of folk across tech, design, law, public health, gender studies, computer science, anthropology, and clinical social work meeting regularly to deconstruct and regenerate the relationship between sex and tech. We've been meeting for about eight months now, but it wasn't so much of a choice to create this group. It was more of a convergence, an organic response to a much needed conversation. The group started like many other subversive communications network form uh, by being able to find each other on the internet, which is why this conversation is so important to have. Uh, Livia Folds, a brilliant designer at Parsons, reached out to me on Twitter when I was posing these questions in my thesis last year and offered to try to collaborate to make this a reality. Uh, she, Livia is now the artistic mastermind uh, behind everything decoding stigma, including these slides, and um, you might recognize her work. Soon after, we were joined by a number of active voices in the Venn diagram of sex work technology and academia, a sort of network of radical individuals stranded on different institutional islands. To try to answer this question, what can, sex, what can tech learn from sex workers? Uh, this panel, this whole conference really embodies what happens when sex workers are cited, invited, and paid. So what can tech learn from sex workers? Um, our first priority is liberatory futures. We want to make space for conversations that don't take precedence when there are so many immediate crises and fires. Um, we put so much energy into all things we're trying to abolish. Uh, what would it look like if we could redirect that energy toward liberation? Um, these are direct quotes from our meetings. This is what we talk about. This is what we hold space for. Um, this comes directly from also from the mindset of Ruha Benjamin, um, whose brilliant book, Captivating Technology, really does inform a lot of the thinking that I do, in which he asks, what social groups are classified, corralled, coerced, and capitalized upon? So others are freely, uh, free to tinker, experiment, uh, design, and engineer the future. And Ruha Benjamin calls us to task by saying, it, the task is to work with others to imagine and create alternatives to the technos quo as part of a larger struggle to materialize collective freedoms and flourishing. So I don't know why the image on the slide isn't showing up, but on December 18th, we hosted a uh, Freedom to Fucking Dream. Uh, this is the healing aftercare event on international, uh, the day after International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers, which is held yearly on December 17th. The idea was to create a space to joyfully world build and nourish the spirit of the movement and celebrate radical network of laborers and accomplices uh, endeavoring to dismantle tech facilitated imperialist ideologies. Uh, this was facilitated by the Oracle of Trans Feminist Technologies, a card deck designed by Sasha Costanza Chuck at MIT's Co Design Lab, and Joana Varon at Coding Rights in Brazil. And it allowed us to radically imagine alternate futures for tech. It was a call for healing the heteropatriarchal hetero horphobia that has been embedded into technology by giving attendees a sort of flight path into the future in which technology had been historically built by sex workers. Our second uh, value is to create a knowledge pool to combine the expertise of people in every part of academia uh, and tech and sex work. We literally want to empower sex workers with technological know-how. So in November, uh, we hosted a workshop in collaboration with Kendra Albert 
um, and Amanda Levinowski, which looked at how to access trademark electronic search system. So sex workers and accomplices can use trademark disclosures to take action against surveillance technology development that threatens the privacy and safety uh, and livelihoods of sexually marginalized uh, and other at-risk communities. More recently, we hosted Jin, the creator of TogetherNet, an open source consent-based communication software built for grassroots software development that centers digital rights and community building. This was a cross-pollinating conversation that helped us better understand the possibilities for our own tech-based community building while providing a sex worker lens to a technologist invested in creating ethics-based social platform. So this is what happens when bridging the gap between sex workers, tech, and academic research. It's a lot. It's digital hygiene and cybersecurity uh, as a priority. It's the demystification of new technology uh, open source resource sharing, consent-based communication, skill shares, collaboration. It goes on to consider responses to lack of access to digital communication, uh, creating litmus tests for research departments, emphasizing the obligation to include sex worker voices in all spaces that purport, purport to design, be designing the future. So our final value or the final value I'm going to present here is the creation of radical networks and connecting a network of the radical individuals stranded on different islands. There is not much I can say about this beyond what you are seeing at this incredible conference. This is what happens when sex workers are invited, cited, and most importantly, paid for their labor. Uh, with that in mind, if you're not already zoomed out, our regular meeting just happens to be tomorrow, uh, April 9th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are opening it up as an informal conference meetup. If you would like to join, uh, please email us at decodingstigma at protonmail.com. And um, I shouldn't have to emphasize this, but this is for community peers. It's, it's not for um, foyers. And it's just to continue the conversation and hopefully meet those who are working in this space. Um, with that in mind, Thank you, and I'll pass it off. Thank you so much, Gabriella. I love how you set this up, um, especially looking through all of the ways in which sex workers contributed to the material infrastructure of the web and talking us through that history and asking those really important questions about harm and safety, safety for whom and at whose expense. Decoding Stigma has been so busy this year and forging some really exciting collaborations and so I can't wait to see uh, where the group goes next and definitely everybody should be encouraged to um, join us tomorrow um, for our next meeting and um, think about ways in which you might like to collaborate with Decoding Stigma in the future. Next up we've got Chibundo Iguati. Um, who is a PhD candidate in sociocultural anthropology at the University of Illinois. Chibundo's research interests engage with the activism of black sex workers, decriminalization and digital space. Chibundo is also a member of the Champaign County Bailout Coalition and an officer in their union, the Graduate Employees Organization. Thanks so much Chibundo. Okay, hi everybody, can you hear me? Well, I can't hear you answer that. So I'm going to assume I'm heard. Um, real quick before I start, I'm going to put my uh, slide deck in the chat so you can follow along. I have a couple definitions that might, might take some time <laughs> to think through if they're the first time you've seen them. But here we go. Let me put the screen up. OK. I'm clicking present, it's just taking a second. <laughs> okay, so uh, my presentation is called On Value Production and Collaborative Futures. My name is Chibundo Aguatu, I should have started there. <laughs> I'm a grad student at the University of Illinois uh, at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I'm in sociocultural anthropology, as Ara just said. 
Um, before I even start, I want to thank uh, Livia for the inspiration of making gifts on everything. I think it has made this presentation a lot more fun to look at. Before this, it was just text on a white screen. <laughs> so thanks for that. Okay, so first a bit about me. So my research interests, I focus on this activism of Black sex workers, thinking of it in the context of Black liberation praxis. Um, and my sites, I'm having some special attentions paid to the digital, but I'm really interested in the interplay between digital and physical spaces um, and thinking of them as uh, just facets of a continuous reality, a continuous social legal re reality, really. Um, so thinking about these spaces as places from which people can be contained within, can be displaced from, and how the colonial gaze just annexes territory and makes terrain out of digital and physical locations, basically. Um, and since I'm focusing on Black sex workers, of course, I'm thinking a lot about the racialized logics of social stratifications. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that bit more when I get into racial capitalism, but basically seeing how uh, people are categorized into types, how those types are put into uh, hierarchies, and how um, those types that are lower on hierarchies are uh, uh, um, basically valued, then devalued. And then um, we in industries of knowledge and uh, information uh, create surplus value from their, their productions, from their thoughts, X, Y, Z. Um, and my question research-wise has always been, well, is currently how are activists building a world where Black people can dwell as they are and as they wish to be? And I see sex work activism as an integral part of Black liberation um, praxis and Black liberation future, Black liberatory futures. Um, and I could give you a bunch of citations, but if you've ever read Morel Miller Young's uh, Taste for Brown Sugar um, or legal scholar uh, Regina Austin, there's a lot of uh, Black feminist work talking about how Black women specifically, but I would say Black people of any marginalized gender are seen as sex workers and therefore how Black people are treated <laughs> affects how sex workers are treated due to this kind of confluence and how sex workers are treated affects how Black people are seen and treated. Um, last thing I'll say about this, if you look at for the, the movement for Black Lives, I believe their manifesto from 2016, they also talk about um, decriminalization of drugs and sex work because of this confluence of racialized treatment. Okay, some key terms and definitions just for what we're talking about today. So I have six, um, they're pretty chunky and I try to make them as vague as, po like not vague, but um, inclusive <laughs> as possible. So first we have the concept of value production. A lot of people define this different ways. So I just try to get a very general, probably widely agreed upon definition of value production as a creative process that sustains and reproduces market economies. Um, human capital which is very important uh, in our post-industrial society, which I'll get into next, but human capital are the human, are human capacities and attributes that can produce economic value. So for example, the idea of like, why am I in a PhD program at all, you know, period. <laughs> it's basically because I know that it will make whatever thoughts and contributions I put into the world be seen as more valuable and even myself as a human more valuable or as a person, let's not get into the discussion of the human right now. Um, third, we have the post-industrialist industrial society. So basically when society, when our society that we're currently in, I would say, uh, at least in the States, we moved from a manufacturing economy to a service economy where there are more um, focus on ideas and human capital rather than the production of goods. So this is very important to talk about to the current audience we have here of academics and technologists. We're all people um, who in some way make money off, make careers off um, ideas, um, and especially the concept of quote unquote innovation. You know, uh, Racial capitalism and surveillance capitalism work really well together to talk about um, how sex workers are treated in the digital. So with racial capitalism, this is from Cedric Robinson, um, the text uh, Black Marxism. Uh, so this is basically the idea of extracting value from people through the unequal differentiation of human value. So all the things I was talking about above, and we see how that really helps describe what we see happening with um, how technologists, academics, um, I'm generally talking about information and knowledge professionals, how we treat sex workers and how we engage with sex work as a concept. And lastly, um, well not lastly, but surveillance capitalism on the other side, um, which is Zuboff, 
uh, producing value from human data. So like human behavioral data, really. Um, and trying to and turning this data into um, use for prediction based behavioral futures markets. So a very simple uh, explanation or I guess example of this could just be Instagram ads, <laughs> how the Instagram ads, the more you start using Instagram, the more it seems like those ads are really already thinking about things you want to be looking for. And then the last one is interest convergence. So um, this is uh, Derek Bell, legal scholar. Um, he talked about this specifically with black folks and white societies, but I'm again, generalizing this idea uh, for use for us here today. So where the interests of the marginalized only advanced are only advanced when aligned with the interests of the powerful. So thinking of us as technologists, as uh, academics, as being in that kind of um, powerful, uh, knowledge producing uh, category for now and thinking of sex workers in this devalued and expropriated knowledge production category, we can see how um, even when we do collaborate, uh, our interests or the interests of our institutions do tend to come first. I, I, I shouldn't hedge that, they do come first. <laughs> All right. So the purpose of this presentation is not to articulate calls for or against capitalist modes of pro value production. I don't think that's the intervention that needs to be made right now to this audience, but it rather it's to talk about the role of our industries and academia is an industry and the production of value from the thoughts, insights and knowledge of sex workers. And I would say just labor in general, um, yeah. So. The question I'm posing to everybody right now, um, and I'm going to show a little exercise of me thinking through this, um, is as researchers, technologists, knowledge producers, et cetera, with, especially with institutional affiliations and who derive our creative authority from colonial processes, uh, what role must we play in bringing about a world where sex workers are not marked for expropriation and disposability? So this is the grounds of which um, I think our collaboration uh, should exist, right? That whatever collaboration we uh, do together as technologists, knowledge producers with sex workers, they must be uh, collaborations towards the goal of sex workers no longer being a marked category for expropriation disposability. That's the only type of intervention <laughs> that is necessary. And since futures, this thought, thinking about futures is a speculative project, we have to think definitely about what is our role in organizing the labor of envisioning futures. So um, basically what I'm saying is that we need to bring sex workers to the table. And the way we bring sex workers to the table is by thinking through how do we fund unpopular work in and outside of the academy. So as a anthropologist person, uh, I've had a lot of trouble trying to figure out how to get resources from grants, fellowships, la di da di da to the people that I care about and to the people that I wanna work with. So um, again, this is my way of thinking through the pre previous question and giving, uh, and the next thing I'm gonna do is give everybody some really, I think concrete suggestions about how we can move forward. Um, these suggestions are not particularly uh, radical. They're actually just using this in the, the, the structures of the institutions we currently are as they work. <laughs> we are, um, as technologists and um, knowledge producers, we live in a space, we exist in a space where um, valuing and recognizing and compensating ideas, that's, that's our entire structure here. So we have ways to do that. <laughs> so let's think more about how we can actually do that for and with sex workers. So here's my first page. So getting people the table. So um, tech is material. So therefore our ethics about this must be material and our support needs to also be material. So since tech needs homes, if we wanna get people to the table to talk about tech, specifically sex workers, um, they need to be housed. So <laughs> they need to be paid. They need to have money, disposable income with which to take care of themselves. And then of course have that surplus energy and attention to give to the projects that we want to put them on. So thinking about the materiality of tech is going to be a very important part here. Um, so just gonna go through these lists. So visiting organic scholar programs, fully funded of course, and um, as, well, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but of course the concept of fully funded <laughs> can be a little dodgy. So you've, we've probably seen fully funded programs where people are still not making enough to live off of. So being very, um, 
to the letter of the law when it comes to the concept of fully funded will be important here. But we already have um, infrastructures for visiting scholar programs. However, these visiting scholar programs are usually based off of institutions speaking to and making value with other institutions. So um, doing some kind of a visiting organic scholar program is something that was really exciting to me when I started writing about this. And that's why it's at the top of this list. Contracting sex worker activists for research projects. Of course, um, at least in my uh, research grants, um, the way we could contract outside help can be pretty vague. Um, so this can mean anything you really need it to mean. Um, since we make ideas, we actually have a lot of leeway to produce uh, spaces for expertise and for outside expertise on our projects. Building relationships with sex worker organizations to be research and development consultants or based testers on projects. Uh, this is pretty uh, cut and dry. Uh, I used to do some beta testing uh, on mostly video game stuff as a, as a child, <laughs> as a youth. Um, so I know how to get on those lists and we know that um, though the, the audience that are the audiences that are built for beta testing research and development work, um, those audiences are built uh, with, with a lot of intention. They're curated very specifically. So make sure that your audience and who the people you are including in your audience, of course, are sex workers. So again, a very conservative, easy thing to do, not particularly creative, just using the structures we already have to recognize expertise and value contributions um, and making sure sex workers are part of those infrastructures. So paid invitations to speak, present, be discussants and respondents in our classes and our conferences and la di da di da. Um, this one again is pretty simple, but as you're seeing here, um, the, the focus on compensation is going to be <laughs> at the forefront of here and it's gonna continue uh, through all of these. And uh, sex workers as sensitivity reviewers for publications. So this is also, I think, a very, very important one here. Um, during my doctoral uh, work and my master's work, honestly, uh, honestly, undergrad work too, when you read a lot of um, stock texts around sex work, academic stock texts around sex work, um, and I'd say particularly within anthropology, uh, I kept feeling that it would have probably been good for at least one sex worker to read this <laughs> before someone decided to publish this. And just being shocked now, especially when I'm in the publishing process, seeing how many eyes, how many Passovers go on um, text before they come to print, um, how at no point did anyone seem to think that the opinion of one sex worker would have been important. All right, last page of suggestions. So building research grants that make material support more fully possible. This of course means we have to start talking to our funding agencies and talking about how our funding agencies um, imagine our interaction with our the communities we care about, the communities we research with and on um, should look like. Uh, so that means like if you have a grant that expressly uh, takes out um, fun, like giving money to your interlocutors, that's probably not a grant that you should be interested in to do work with sex workers. So us as researchers also can be pretty uh, uh, specific in how we choose which funding sources we move forward with. Um, recruiting sex workers and skill development courses you host. So if you have skill development courses in tech skills and grant writing skills pretty broadly, um, please recruit sex workers to be in those in those courses. We, again, know how recruiting course um, for courses go. So making sure that sex workers are in the audience of that recruitment pool is a very conservative and simple thing you can do to make sure that skills are being given to the, the, the populations that need skills in order to be at the table to talk about these things. And of course, training and hiring sex workers to teach those courses. So this can be a recursive process where uh, you recruit sex workers for these courses, train them, and then hire them to teach the courses. Um, and of course, bring the information back to their own communities. Citing sex workers in your syllabi, in your papers, in your talks, again, very simple. My first uh, conference paper ever was on a concept called citational justice, where I wrote about pro-hoism. Femi Babylon was here earlier this week, and it's really exciting to be in a same webinar series with this person who my first writing as an academic was about. Um, but that citational work that I suggested as my first piece, I saw how uncomfortable people were with it. And it's just showing how our citational processes or citational practices are extremely colonial as well. 
Um, hiring multilingual sex workers for translation services. This is, of course, is a great intervention um, into work we do with migrant sex workers, especially though um, sex workers of all sorts of nationalities have different uh, language uh, crudities. But this is a big one for working with uh, uh, migrant workers. Hiring the workers you're actually working with and doing research with to translate is something very simple. We have spaces within our grants to do this. We have spaces within our institutions to do this. And then lastly, the last suggestion I have here is building research projects with sex worker collaborators in our teams. So that means that you have sex workers at every stage of the research gathering, the research, like even planning the research project at every step. And of course, writing their payment into your budgets. So this is just my own little exercise trying to answer this question for myself and giving that to y'all. So I wanna leave everyone with um, three qualifications to think more about this concept and maybe a little less conservatively about how um, our, the futures of sex worker and industry collaborations should look like, can look like, must look like for a future where uh, sex workers aren't expropriated and disposed of um, to exist. So number one, how do we transform our funding structures to support sex worker activists? So this means funding structures in your institutions, in your companies, your IRBs. So if you have an institutional review board of so, or some sort of institutional um, oversight committee for your research, this means um, really thinking more about how those institutions are kind of recreating this, this racialist logic of ranking and devaluing sex workers. Two, how do we hold our funding structures accountable for not accommodating material support? That is a question you have to answer for yourself. We have a lot of funding structures. Um, yeah. And then three, how do we build structures that materially support and respect the expertise of sex workers uh, towards creating a digital future not based on the reproduction and expropriation of stratified difference? Okay, that's it from me. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much, Chibundo. And that's a really important framing, thinking about labor, thinking about material infrastructure, thinking about racial capitalism um, and those processes of extraction. And I know you've been thinking and talking a lot lately about those ideas of permissibility and dwelling in space and um, critiquing who owns the space and who owns the content, who, who owns the ideas. So thank you for giving us such concrete suggestions. Um, for a whole range of issues from funding to redistribution of wealth and labor and really handy tips for not just um, peers and communities, but also for um, industry um, and for academia. Finally, we have Yin Q. Yin is a queer non-binary Chinese American mother, kink educator, writer, producer, and sex worker rights activists. Yin's writing can be found in Afro-Asia Anthology, Bust, Point Magazine, and the We Too Anthology recently published by Feminist Press. Their media work includes Mercy Mistress and Fly in Power. Yin is the founder and creative director of Kink Out, Body of Workers, and co-organizer with Red Canary Song. Welcome, Yin. Hi, thank you so much. Um... Yeah, so I'm in queue and I just also dropped my slides in the doc, um, in the chat. And I'm going to also put the Venmo for anyone who wants to um, also support the work that I'm going to be presenting today. Please make sure you um, reference this panel as well as body of workers, which I'm going to be presenting. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oops, sorry. So I want to thank um, Hacking Hustling, of course, as well as the um, BK Center. And um, we have been working with um, Kendra Albert from the BK Center um, Cyber Law Clinic and her their amazing team of Sasha and Mays uh, during this time of creating Body of Workers, during our time at uh, iBeam Org, um, which is the tech and art, art organization that uh, has really supported the residency in the, in the beginning founding sections of, of um, creating this space. So first I wanted to talk about Body of Workers, um, which is a platform that 
um, kink out an eviction and a few um, different kinds of coalitions of sex working orgs and allies have uh, brought together during phase one of the I-BEAM residency this past year, I think, believe it was last summer that it started um, in phase one, Veil Machine, um, which is a group of three and other producers, um, Sybil Fury, Nico Flux, and Empress Wu. Uh, Veil Machine produced Eviction, which was a self-destructing virtual art house horror gallery that was alive for 12 hours on um, August 21st of 2020. After the event, sex workers were attend who attended expressed a desire for permanent platform like eviction where their art and community could thrive, free from censorship and surveillance. I also want to speak about how um, the work that I've been doing with Kink Out um, has been bringing sex working organizations as well as um, the kink and leather communities into museum spaces, such as Leslie Lohman Performance Space New York. And then during the winter of 2019-20, during a residency at PS1 MoMA, um, we had an art and activism um, create, uh, residency that hosted both um, a literature reading um, space in the art space where there was zine making as well as lighting, writing, writing letters to incarcerated sex workers. And then we also hosted spaces in February of um, 2020. And that was a, a over 600 people coming through the VW dome of, of um, PS1 MoMA um, of over 30 different artists and collaborators creating um, work that represented sex work, leather work, um, the leather community and, and, um, and the queer community. So during that residency, Kink Out also began conceptualizing an online sex workers archive and art space that could house and connect workers on a global scale. This really came about during a conversation that I was having with um, other allies about how SESTA FOSTA was, was affecting um, our friends, our community. Um, a friend of mine in the as a sex worker said told me that their Instagram had been taken down seven different times. They were constantly getting banned and they still are. Um, and so since one of the, my drives in, in activists and has always been through art, I started looking, looking online at like online um, museums. I've also been a sex worker for over 25 years now. And um, so I really saw, I was actually in the spaces <laughs> where, where, where places like Arrow's Guide um, started being created and um, have been using websites, creating my own website um, or having friends help me um, develop them as well as using spaces like LiveJournal um, and have been seeing like the, the progression of these different kinds of spaces, but then also the um, destruction of and the targeting of during, during this time. So my thoughts were to create a space online through art that can really create a space for sex workers by sex workers um, of connecting community to each other. So for phase two of our IBEAM organized um, residency, Kink Out and Veil Machine produced an awe, uh, um, started to team up to produce a virtual sex workers museum. For this residency, our first step was launching um, Body of Workers, which is a private gallery. Now I want to speak about a little bit about why we, we wanted to create a private gallery. First, um, it's a private uncensored social space, um, art space formed by sex workers to address immediate deplatforming needs of censorship threats and to create a revenue generating model that can eventually sustainably fund the museum. Uh, so the idea is for the, the worker, sorry, for the platform to be a bit of private gallery. Um, and I, I describe it something like the space behind the strippers um, stage, the locker room, the den, um, or basically the bar where sex workers meet up <laughs> um, or the, tea, you know, the, the spaces where we come together to, to support each other, to talk smack, <laughs> to um, share all of um, each other's stories, but also resources, um, talk about health needs, um, refer lawyers. I mean, there's there's so much that we do that is being, has been done online and then has been targeted and taken away from us. Um, so creating that sort of inner space that feels really safe, and I'm gonna use the word safe, although it's, as we know, 
um, no space is truly safe. This is more of a brave space. But when I say um, a virtual safe house, it's just sort of a, um, a flagging to other sex workers that this is for them. This is not a space that we're, that is targeting just to use their their bodies and their and their um, work to to for the gains of of any other corporation. So we're trying to create a, a safe space that um, where people can share um, works to each other. And by using the privacy buttons on the on the space, they can also um, sort of lift that veil so that it can be seen by other patrons that can come through onto the site as well. Um, so that curators, patrons of art, um, anybody who wants to contact that, that worker then can can look them up quick, quickly, um, knowing where where their work is, where the location of work um, by cities, and in this way. Um, it's kind of creating like this virtual peep show as well, so that uh, people from the public can then also see what what we're doing, um, and that we have control of that of that content and what is being seen. Um, because as we know, so many um, so much of sex worker art, as well as, well as culture and work, has been put out there, but then stolen, taken, doxxed, <laughs> whatever you know, and then. Um, appropriated and then placed into the hands of Netflix pr producers, as well as you know, numerous numerous movies that have been made about sex workers um, and about sex worker stories, and yet have never then gone back into the community. So, Body Workers is the first private online um, gallery space that then will um, hopefully be able to be our first step in creating a sex workers museum. Um, this is just um, a bit of the coalitions that we've been working with, but um, these are just to name a few. They're mostly New York City um, based coalitions. However, we plan to cast a really wide net um, for body of workers and then on the scale of the sex, uh, sorry, for sex workers museum, we'd like to go on a absolutely as global as we can, so that we are hiring, um, contacting, connecting, and collaborating with workers in their cities so that they can express their needs, express their curation of what, what should go into their own ex exhibits. Um, okay, so this again is a little explanation about how Body Workers runs as a tiered membership-based virtual art salon um, for sex workers. Body of Workers is a private social media platform where we can share art stories and collective care. And for non-sex workers, um, Body of Workers is a peep show into our world. So allies and clients can pay to view our members' contents and profiles, learn about sex workers' perspectives and discover new ways of supporting and meeting providers. Um, our needs to be addressed. Body of Workers pushes back against the censorship of sex workers experience on corporate and social media platforms under laws like sesta FOSTA. Our struggles are such that, you know, sex workers are constantly being shadow banned, deplatformed, censored. Um, their work is constantly being appropriated. In the age of COVID-19, these platforms are our primary sites for sharing art, stories, and building community because pl deplatforming and censorship can happen at any moment, our profiles, our archives are disappearing forever without notice. And as you can see from our art by Jack the Stripper on the side, um, this is like a little bit about what is going on on Instagram. Um, so our solution is as a space of artistic expression, body of workers resists regulations imposed by tech platforms in response to SESTA-FOSTA and offers a free safe space for sex workers to create and convene. In February, 2021, we presented a prototype version of body of workers for sex and working artists. Um, we are planning to do a soft launch of the beta site this summer of 2021, and our goal is to have 30 to 50 artist profiles live at the time of our prototype launch. Um, on launch day, we'll open registration to other sex working artists, and the general public will be able to see a select artwork from existing artists for a limited time during our prototype launch week. Uh, the homepage, which I'm 
not showing at this time because we're still um, in development. Um, the homepage would be a minimalist landing page to prompt login for the first veil or to log in as an artist and to as a sex working artist, they would also then be invited to create their own profile. On the inside to grow the platform, artists must create a profile to go in and all artists can browse all pro profiles from inside. However, artists can control what, who can see their individual works. Again, that, that would be through the privacy settings. All users can see the artists listed on the platform, learn more about their browsing their profiles, react to artwork. And artwork can be made visible to only the artists all other artists, all users, and the general public. Um, granular data points gathered for each artwork will be enable rich, rich filtering of our database in later version of the platform. I also want to mention right now that um, we've been working with um, our cyber team um, on the terms and services of that usually on most platforms have been specifically um, quite violent against sex workers in terms of using um, workers' bodies, and yet also, as uh, as we have said, uh, or has, uh, as Gabriella has mentioned in the course, has also seen it as disposable. So we have been working to create terms and services that, for one thing, is is language that is easily um, understandable, but also that it protects the actual artists and not just the platform. And that's been extremely important to us um, in terms of how we are creating and designing the work. Uh, also, what goes on be behind the actual platform creation has also been really important to, to us of like, how are we storing people's information, um, making sure that we don't keep any legal information, that we don't keep in any legal names, that only um, emails are being used to contact. Uh, that all artwork is being looked at by human eyes um, so that we can understand like community agreements, keeping it safe space um, and making sure that it doesn't become an abusive space. Uh, I also want to mention that one of the, along with how we are working on behind the scenes, um, even during the residency, we cast a wide net of like who we wanted to start working on the, on the um, on the tech platform itself, even though many of us weren't coders, <laughs> we weren't, we aren't in tech. Um, however, creating the platform is one side, creating the community, creating how the work happens behind the scenes um, is just as important to us. So making sure that our work can be accessible as well as uplifting of the most marginalized and vulnerable communities within our, um, within our industries has been extremely important to us. Um, so this is some of our questions that we've been asking for ourse ourselves um, and trying to answer them amongst other sex workers. So how do we protect the data of users? How do we design for diversity? Vetting incoming, incoming artist applications, um, making the platform accessible for as many as people as possible, and what are third parties we can work with who are sex worker friendly. I also want to mention that with my work with Red Canary Song, I work with um, a very mar marginalized migrant community that does not um, use tech, um, except for certain platforms like WeChat. Um, so they're not necessarily on places like um, even Zoom or, <laughs> or um, going on to places like sex workers museum or um, so language is very important to us um, not imposing the words of sex work necessarily upon the entire communities who may be affected or whom we want to to uh, welcome has also been um, in discussions and this is the last team that is behind the work at this moment um, we do have more people working on our tech team. Thank you so much, Yin. This is such an incredible project that we're all so excited about. And it's such a perfect example of how sex workers are creating alternative platforms and rejecting those terms of use. Um, 
and you've been forming so many important community connections and coalitions in that in that process and it's it's such a practical artistic um, and innovative way to archive all uh, sex worker stories as, as well as build community. And thank you for sharing those really useful questions at the end, which will be very helpful for others um, doing similar projects around all this stuff around privacy and, and vetting and, and access. We are um, running out of time and um, there's some really interesting questions in the chat around um, better regulation of tech companies and virtual reality and sex robots. And we're just gonna to have to park that for another time because we obviously have way too much to say and we could be talking for hours. So I'm just going to ask each of the panelists a very quick question um, to conclude, uh, which is what are your top three things that need to happen for a sex worker regulatory future? And I'm gonna hand over to Gabriella to begin. Um, I'll be quick. Uh, I think my response is just one and it's just stop being so embarrassed. Um, you, you like, I feel like so much of the issue with tech design is those getting their ideas from places uh, that they are embarrassed to admit and then using that knowledge as some sort of epiphany that they had without um, actually just um, giving credit to, to, to the person who is hidden behind the curtain. And it's, it's really upsetting and violent. Sorry, I'm next because I was next and I got it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so I have three things that I'm thinking of and they're more like just, I guess, wisdom. So the first one comes from uh, Tuck and Yang. So they had this really great article that, uh, about R words um, research. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they, their indigenous scholars talk a lot about decolonizing knowledge production. So in their R words, they have three provocations. The first two um, that I think are really useful here would be one is research the intervention that is necessary in the projects that you see. And two, um, there's knowledge that our institutions do not deserve. So <laughs> knowing that <laughs> if you wanna help someone out or help or be a part of something, does your institution need to be a part of this? That's a big question to ask yourself. And when you're collecting information to turn that into a project, is the machine you're about to put this information in, is that safe for the people whose information you just took? Um, basic ethics things. Two, um, if you're engaging in a project where I'm not expert, like, I guess uh, uh, processes of expropriation would make the project untenable. The project is untenable, okay? <laughs> Again, another ethics thing, very basic. Um, the project shouldn't exist. If la like stopping um, these processes of expropriation would destroy your career or destroy your institutions, both your institutions and your career should not exist. That's, it's just that simple. Um, and then lastly, um, the money is already printed. So going back to my whole thing with funding, um, our, our institutions got the money. It's already printed, it's all collected. So our job here is really to think about how do we make new ways or um, use the ways that are currently existing to make sure that sex workers are being compensated for the labor that they have already put into all of our projects, to the data that we've already taken from all of them. Um, just figuring out how to not even make it right, but just do basic things that we already do for people who are not seen as sex workers. That's it. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would, <laughs> I, th I think those answers are incredible. Um, I'd also say um, to start designing with the idea of joy and care in mind um, for as we start to, to, you know, as sex workers are starting to take the homes really and like really um, feel empowered to, to, to be there and take the space to create set, uh, tech for, uh, for sex workers that, um, so I'm speaking more to my sex worker organizers that to constantly make sure that we're inserting joy and, and celebration of each other um, and reaching out to each other with, uh, with a lot of uh, radical love and that that can be incorporated in our technology as well as we create it for each other um, and that we don't want to necessarily continuously create platforms that are mirrors of the capitalist society, you know, oppression and, um, discarding of bodies and discarding of, of, of what our work even means. I think that, um, yeah, I think that that's my answer is to bring more joy. <laughs> and also to, I, for the, this, this kind of will, will 
um, it is sort of a tangent from what you just said, Chipundo, uh, but also just, yeah, accepting that um, all, all of our bodies have desires. And so, and that's going to translate into our tech as well. So just sitting with that and accepting that for oneself is really important on an individual basis as well as a community. Yes to joy, yes to radical love. Thank you so much for all of your absolutely brilliant minds. That is all we have time for, but everybody in the audience, I really encourage you to donate to Red Canary Song, to Decoding Stigma, to Hacking Hustling, to follow our speakers um, on Twitter and Instagram and support their projects. Attend the rest of the conference or you can watch it later on the Hacking Hustling YouTube. Um, speak to your local sex worker organization and learn more about how you can help um, and find ways that you can pay and support sex worker peer initiatives. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm so grateful and in awe of all of our wonderful speakers. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you.